Mary Ridge. Hello. And for those of you all who've uh, watched any of the other programs the National Military Park has presented um, earlier today or yesterday or the day before as part of um, our this year virtual recognition of the anniversary of the battles for Chattanooga, the 157th um, anniversary. Um, glad that you have, um, have come back to join us for, uh, for this program. If this is the first that you have participated in, thank you for, um, uh, for participating in it. And I'd encourage you to go back and watch some of the other programs that we've done over the last few days and really the last couple of weeks to recognize the uh, anniversaries of the events that occur in the fall of 1863, the concluding events of the campaign for Chattanooga. We're at Orchard Knob. Seized on the afternoon of November the 23rd, what became the first day of the battles for Chattanooga, Orchard Knob was quickly recognized by the Federals as not only a good vantage point towards the Confederate lines um, at the western base of Missionary Ridge, um, or, or that it gave the Army of the Cumberland, which had been cooped up in Chattanooga for the last two months, now some maneuver room, particularly relative to the potential of reaching up to the north and joining Sherman's troops once they initiate their action on November the 24th, but particularly on that November the 24th. As Grant's main effort in this campaign begins to unfold, Sherman's crossing of the Tennessee River at the mouth of South Chickamauga Creek to facilitate his strike against the Confederate right flank along Missionary Ridge, and as it turned out, the Battle of Lookout Mountain on November 24, um, 1863, it was recognized that this high, uh, largely open knoll um, about 1,700 yards from Fort Wood and about that same distance to the Confederate line of works at the base of Missionary Ridge was also a good observation point or vantage point. Bridges Illinois Battery had been brought out here after its seizure on November the 23rd and increasingly on November the 24th. Union officers of all grades began to appear here on the top of this rise to watch the expected course of action. Um, they wanted to see Sherman's attack go off to the north, um, and what they did here through the fog and mist of that rainy, drizzly day was the Battle of Lookout Mountain unfold to their southwest. But when things did not go as Grant had originally planned on November the 24th, Sherman's attack um, uh, coming really for naught against the Confederate right flank, and Grant had to plan another day of battle here, where again, Sherman reinforced by troops of the 11th Corps and even some troops of the Army of the Cumberland would continue to be the main effort against the Confederate right flank. And in our earlier program today, we talked about um, the limited um, success that Sherman had in his attacks on, on the north end of Missionary Ridge. But Grant also that day ordered Joseph Hooker whose three divisions the day before had seized the northern tip of Lookout Mountain, and most importantly, the routes over the northern tip of the mountain. Hooker was to bring those three divisions from the slopes of Lookout Mountain across Chattanooga Valley, um, across flooded Chattanooga Creek, and attack the new Confederate right or left flank along Missionary Ridge. For overnight, Braxton Bragg, having realized that he had lost the most important part of Lookout Mountain, um, and um, that thereby his line across Chattanooga Valley between Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge was rendered essentially useless, Bragg had repositioned troops. He had ordered the troops who had been in position in Chattanooga Valley to abandon their positions in the valley and fall back along Missionary Ridge. And the Confederate line was extended along Missionary Ridge to Rossville Gap. 
Um, and increasingly, as Confederates have been building field fortifications on the ridge itself, at last, after the loss of Orchard Knob on November the 23rd, additional Confederate units will take position on Missionary Ridge itself. And as the 25th of November passed, as Ulysses S. Grant, um, accompanied by Quartermaster General Montgomery Meigs, um, Under Secretary of War Charles Dana, um, David Hunter, a senior Union officer as an inspector, um, other um, uh, members of the military division of the Mississippi staff, uh, George Thomas, um, and to, uh, Thomas's two corps commanders uh, of the 4th and 14th Corps, Gordon Granger and John Palmer, um, and some of the division commanders are all gathered here on Orchard Knob, expecting to see Sherman drive the Confederates southward along the ridge and see Hooker roll up the Confederate left flank. But as morning passes to the afternoon, it is clear that Sherman's attacks against the north end of the ridge are not making progress driving the Confederate line to the south. And Ulysses S. Grant, cognizant that another day is, um, is passing, um, another day in which he is not able to dispatch a relief column towards Knoxville, grows increasingly concerned as the afternoon wears on that um, it may be yet another day of battle here at Chattanooga before he can drive Bragg away. Bragg, uh, Grant that afternoon, as he observed um, Missionary Ridge, believed um, increasingly that he was seeing Confederate troop movements on Missionary Ridge that were indicating the Confederates shifting troops to the north to help stymie Sherman or to the south to stymie um, uh, Joseph Hooker. And desirous of, um, of preventing that, Grant in mid-afternoon will turn to the commander of the Army of the Cumberland, George Thomas, and order George Thomas to conduct a demonstration against the Confederate rifle pit line at the base of the ridge, a line of works that had been there for the last two months on the crest of a low rise just out from the western base of the ridge, um, and which had been the main Confederate position until after Orchard Knob had been lost on the 23rd and the Confederates had begun to develop new positions on the ridge um, itself. George Thomas's um, Army of the Cumberland troops deployed um, here um, at and in front of Orchard Knob to both the north and south are to move forward and, um, and threaten the Confederate um, center, move against the rifle pits at the base of the ridge. Now throughout most of the day, there had been just three Army of the Cumberland divisions deployed here fronting um, the center of Missionary Ridge. Early that morning, in an effort to reinforce um, Sherman, uh, Absalom Baird's division of the 14th Corps had been marched from the Union right across the rear of the other three divisions and marched up north towards Sherman um, to, uh, to be additional reinforcements for Sherman. At the same time, uh, Richard Johnson's division and Phil Sheridan's divisions had adjusted their position in the valley below and here, Thomas, in front of us, Thomas J. Wood's division had pressed forward just a little ways with their skirmish line, and much of the Confederate skirmish line had been driven back and driven into the rifle pits at the base of the ridge. But Sherman had not um, taken Grant's offer of Baird's division. When Absalom Baird reached Sherman near the north end of the ridge, uh, Sherman um, informed Baird that he was not needed, and Baird's division had actually turned around and marched back south. And as Grant was making the decision to um, send Thomas forward in a demonstration, Baird's division was completing its redeployment on the left now of a four-division front of the Army of the Cumberland. 
the Absalom Baird's division of the 14th Corps, then Thomas J. Woods and Phil Sheridan's divisions of Gordon Granger's 4th Corps, and on the right, Richard Johnson's division of the 14th Corps. A force of over 20,000 Union soldiers deployed here in the valley in front of Missionary Ridge. Grant's order to Thomas for this demonstration then had to be repeated down the chain of command from Thomas to the two Corps commanders, Gordon Granger and John Palmer, then to the four um, division commanders, and then to the 12 brigade commanders along the line. Um, that would take some time, particularly for the 14th Corps staff because their two divisions are on either end of the line. Um, and before the orders for this limited assault had filtered fully down the chain of command, the prearranged signal, a signal that had been um, uh, 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 identified in the orders that had been issued on the 24th of November to the Army of the Cumberland to hold themselves in readiness to assault Missionary Ridge, that signal, the firing of the six guns of Bridges, Illinois battery from here at Orchard Knob in rapid succession is heard by the uh, Army of the Cumberland troops in the valley in front. Um, and soon thereafter, the bugles will sound forward as this more than 20,000 man Union force on about a two mile front moves forward towards the Confederates on Missionary Ridge. At the same moment that um, the six guns fire in rapid succession, the um, heavier Federal artillery in Fort Wood and Fort Negley um, will intensify their um, uh, rate of fire against the Confederates on the ridge, um, and Federal soldiers will raise a cheer in the valley and then step forward and move forward in the assault towards Missionary Ridge. Watching expectantly from here on the top of Orchard Knob is Ulysses S. Grant, George Thomas, Gordon Granger, John Palmer, and other luminaries of the Union leadership that fall of 1863 here in the Chattanooga area. Park historian Jim Ogden now stands forward facing at the crest of Missionary Ridge. To his immediate right are the concrete post and iron cabled guardrails of Crest Road. To his immediate left is a cleared view lot on the ridge, with the area around the lot being heavily wooded. In the distance is the city of Chattanooga, and rising above it all is Lookout Mountain. Four Confederates positioned along the crest of Missionary Ridge on November the 25th. The fact that the Federals were likely to attack this position seemed to become increasingly evident during the course of the day. In late morning, midday, um, Union uh, troops of, um, of in particular, um, Woods, Sheridan's, and Johnson's divisions advanced their skirmish lines and pushed the Confederate skirmishers back um, out of the, um, their, their forward positions and right into the base of the rifle pits. Um, and then um, sniping and sharpshooting began from Federals at the edge of the woods against the Confederates in the rifle pits. And this view with the clear evidence of Union troops moving in the, um, in the valley um, uh, was a, an impressive and frightful sight for those Confederates that day. Um, the um, uh, Missionary Ridge was still mostly wooded at the time, but it was very open woods, although in many places on the slopes there was, um, was underbrush. In a few places, trees had been cut, um, clearing um, view from the crest of the ridge, but in a lot of points um, you still had the, um, the open woods. As you reach the base of the ridge, there was a two to 300 yard um, zone in which most of the Confederate camps were located. And then there was the crest of the low rise of ground along which the Confederate rifle pits were located. And out in front of that, for um, as little as about 300 yards or as much as 900 yards, there was mostly clear or open ground. 
The Confederates had cut some trees to create or increase the fields of observation and fields of fire, uh, but in, um, in places where you, um, you had as much as 900 yards of open ground in front of the rifle pit line, that generally was an area where there was already an existing or even a couple of existing uh, farm fields or agricultural fields, um, which with the cutting of maybe just a few trees, um, created that open view of as much as 900 yards. But with the Federals having pushed the Confederates back to the edge of, uh, or to the rifle pits, and the Federal skirmishers advancing to the edge of the woods, there is a relatively heated skirmish engagement going on into the afternoon. As the, um, uh, as the Federals um, prepare to advance, um, the, some Confederates grow very concerned about the nature of their defensive position. Uh, based on orders, most Confederate units along this line have been divided with half of their strength in the rifle pits at the base of the ridge and half of their strength at, um, in the new positions being developed on the ridge itself. This is generally done within, uh, within brigades um, along the, uh, the line. Within the commander of, um, of the division in this sector, um, James Patton Anderson, commanding Hindman's division, the man in command of the troops in the rifle pit at the base of the ridge um, is Brigadier General Zachariah Days. And Days will write in, um, in his um, report, I was put in command of the troops in the breastworks at the foot of Missionary Ridge consisting of halves of Vaughn's, Day's, Manigo's, Anderson's, um, and the whole of Reynolds' brigades, and with a strong line of skirmishers. The balance of the division was posted on the crest of the ridge under the immediate command of General Anderson. On examination of the ground, I became satisfied that this position his, with the half of the troops at the base of the ridge, was very disadvantageous, especially so with the orders I had for the reason that if the men, had ma had, if the men made a stubborn resistance as ordered and were overpowered by numbers, capture or annihilation were the alternatives, as retreat with the enemy close on us up the steep uh, ascent of the hill behind would have been impossible. For this and other reasons, I went to General Anderson and begged that he would order the troops um, at the bottom of the ridge to the crest, where I was satisfied a much better fight could be made. He was, um, was turned down initially in, um, in that request, um, but subsequently he received word um, that um, uh, I, uh, was not to fight at the breastworks, but to fall back when the enemy's line approached within 200 yards, skirmishing up the hill and form on the crest with the balance of the division. This division of brigades um, between the uh, rifle pits at the base of the ridge and the top of the ridge is going to break up the structure of, um, of the brigades and it is also going to um, limit the fire of the troops who are on the top of the ridge while their comrades withdraw up the, uh, the face of the ridge. Um, and as it turns out when the Federals do advance that afternoon, um, that exact um, uh, situation will, um, will unfold. Uh, Arthur Manigo, the commander of one of the brigades um, further south along this part of the line, um, that will write, the troops in the last mentioned line, the rifle pits, in obedience to obstruction, in instructions received, delivered their fire and rapidly retreated out of the works, endeavored to join their comrades on the crest with the least possible delay. These men, knowing that during the passage from one point to another that they would be subjected to a heavy fire of artillery and musketry which they could not return, endeavored to accomplish the distance with too much speed. The consequence was that many failed to reach the summit at all, 
but fell exhausted. Some were killed or wounded, and those who at last gained the crest reached it in a broken down, exhausted, and demoralized condition. Many of the, them were forced to throw away arms, accoutrements, and knapsacks, or in the effort to preserve them, ran the risk of being captured themselves. As the Federals um, advance, this um, uh, uh, odd or fractured um, nature of the Confederate defenses begins to become um, evident. In a few places, the order to withdraw to the top of the ridge has not um, been received, and units actually do attempt to fight um, and maintain their positions in the rifle pits at the base of the ridge. But in most places, the Confederate soldiers, while they might fire um, one or two shots from the base of the ridge, and then maybe a few more as they go up the side of the ridge, most of the Confederates simply try to move up to the top of the ridge, but as Manigo notes, many of them have expended so much energy that by the time they reach the crest, they have no um, uh, energy with which to, um, to continue the fight. As a result, as the Federals advance a two-mile front stretching south from the area um, in your view now, um, uh, as they move forward, their skirmishers leading through the open woods um, to and out into the, uh, the open fields, followed by the main um, battle lines, generally in most brigades, um, a front line deployed in line of battle and then support units in column of division behind. Uh, for many Confederates, it seemed as if the entire world was advancing um, on them in blue. The Federals will, um, will sweep forward. The, con the Confederates have about 50 artillery pieces on the, uh, the crest of the ridge, and those guns will immediately open fire. For the Federals, that initially seemed to be a potentially hazardous um, uh, uh, fire. However, they quickly realized that most of the Confederate artillery is on the very tops of the hill, um, and they cannot depress their guns to fire down on the Confederate lines themselves. And quickly, the Federal lines literally advance underneath of the um, uh, Confederate uh, artillery fire. The Federals will surge across the open ground and reach the rifle pits at the base of the ridge. The, um, the knowledge that this was intended to be a limited attack against the rifle pits at the base of the ridge has not been fully understood down the chain of command. And after resting and reorganizing a few minutes, um, the, um, uh, the orders to continue the advance are given and federal soldiers begin to work their way up the slope of the ridge. In the sector where we are now, um, where the, um, the brigade under Colonel Edwin Phelps of the 38th Ohio, the left flank brigade of the Army of the Cumberland's Assault, the left flank brigade of Baird's division, one of the regiments attacking in the, is the 74th Indiana. And there, Lieutenant Colonel Myron Baker will write in the report, at the point where the 74th ascended the ridge, uh, it has an altitude of 500 feet. And it is so steep that at some places it required all the strength one could put forth, together with what assistance might be derived from holding on to bushes and pulling oneself up by them to make the ascent. But notwithstanding the difficulty of approaching the rebel position, the men, inspired by an uncontrollable enthusiasm and burning with a desire to avenge their recent disaster in September last, tugged up the hill as best they might, many of them at times from exhaustion or from the abrupt rise of the ground, being compelled to drag themselves along on their hands and feet towards the summit of the mountain ridge, which seemed alive with artillery, so rapid and incessant was its use. It seemed evident that these batteries would be staunchly supported by infantry, and after having escaped so well the missiles from the artillery, we had every reason to anticipate a warm reception uh, from the infantry. Nearly to the top of the hill, 
you could discern the long line of breastworks rudely constructed of stones and logs behind which it was likely a strong rebel force would be posted ready to receive us. A force probably deemed by their general adequate to repel any direct assault from the front. But despite the discouraging appearance of the undertaking, those brave spirits who had faced the consuming fire and furious assaults of the enemy at Chickamauga were not the man, men to falter, however desperate the enterprise might seem. But advancing as rapidly as possible soon reached the brow of the ridge and with fixed bayonets contributed their share to the work of driving the rebels from their rude fortifications, which were in turn used by us during a part of the ensuing fight which on the left of the brigade, near where Colonel Phelps was killed, raged with a great deal of severity for nearly a half an hour. When being completely routed, the enemy fled in the wildest confusion, leaving his dead and wounded on the field. In multiple places along the, uh, this two-mile front, units of the Army of the Cumberland will make it up to the crest of the ridge and penetrate the Confederate line. And what seemingly for Bragg was a uh, potentially strong defensive position begins to quickly unravel. Park historian Jim Ogden stands forward facing in a mowed grassy area. To his right are two bronze cannons mounted on two wheeled carriages. Behind him is a house. In a moment he will begin to walk to his left at which a tall granite monument in a wooded area will be visible. He will stop a few steps away, and the city of Chattanooga will be visible from an open area of the crest of Missionary Ridge. In addition to the, uh, the crazy Confederate defensive scheme of splitting units between the rifle pits of the base of the ridge and uh, on the, uh, the crest of the ridge, there was also a great deal of movement within the Confederate line. Now, at Orchard Knob, Ulysses S. Grant had detected some of this Confederate movement and believed it was the shifting of troops from the center of the Confederate line here towards their right and left to stymie Sherman and Hooker's efforts against their flanks. But in actuality, the troops who had left this area to go to the left or right had generally done so much earlier in the day or even the day before. But within this sector, there was still a significant movement of troops. The division that eventually would fight on this part of the Confederate line and stretch southward here towards Bragg's headquarters was the division uh, under the command of Brigadier General William B. Bate. Normally it was the division commanded by John Breckinridge, but he was at that moment an acting corps commander. Uh, Bates' division had been in position in the valley um, in front of Missionary Ridge on the 24th and the days earlier, but on the night of the 24th, the early morning hours of the 25th, they had been pulled back onto the crest of Missionary Ridge, stretching from Bragg's headquarters southward towards Breckenridge's headquarters at the point where the Ringgold Road crossed the ridge. But then in early afternoon, that uh, uh, division, Bates' division, was ordered to move northward and to move north of Bragg's headquarters and place their right flank at or near the left of Heinemann's or Anderson's division to the north. The, even this became complicated when, as Bate moved into this sector, he found another brigade, Gibson's Louisiana Brigade of Stewart's division and eventually the Louisianans are shifted south to take position right at Bragg's headquarters. And Bates' men only a short time before, as it turns out, the Federals actually do attack, move into position along the line. On Bates' right, the battery of artillery, the 5th Company Washington Artillery from New Orleans, is positioned. And its commander, um, uh, Slocum, will divide the battery in half and three of its guns, two of its Napoleons, and one of its rifle guns will be placed on the um, eminence, as he called it, or rise at this point, and a couple of hundred yards to um, his left would be the other half of the battery. 
as the fifth company took position here. They found partially completed Confederate works, um, but they found that by taking those works, the guns were positioned too much on the crest and were not positioned to be able to fire down the slope in their front. And as the um, action intensifies that afternoon, uh, Slocum will have Lieutenant Sharon move the right half battery outside of the works and position them where they can fire down into the valley below. And as the Federals um, begin their advance, um, the guns will, um, will open fire. Uh, Slocum and Sharon quickly recognize that uh, even by moving outside of the work, their range is going to be limited. Uh, but they uh, open fire very uh, rapidly, as much as anything, according to Slocum, to try to intimidate the Federals as they advance, um, but also to give confidence to Confederates. Slocum is concerned. There is no infantry support directly um, in the sector of his battery, uh, and there is a gap of a couple of hundred yards to his right where, as he understands it, Reynolds' brigade of Anderson's division was supposed to be positioned. As um, Slocum's men open fire, they will actually cause the Federals um, uh, essentially to their front to diverge to both the, their left and their right, taking shelter behind um, undulations on the surface of the ridge. Um, but uh, unknown to them at that moment, Federals are working their way up the draws and ravines towards the crest of the ridge. Because of the deteriorating command situation within the Army, which resulted in lower morale at lower levels, um, uh, uh, attention to detail within the Army has deteriorated and even though Bragg has been the besieger, so to speak, in the fall of 1863, uh, rations within his army have been very low, particularly for the animals. And as Slocum had moved into this position, um, the weakened state of his teams was such that he was forced to leave his caissons in the ground below. With only 32 rounds in a chest of ammunition for a 12-pound Napoleon, his gunners went through that ammunition very quickly. And despite the fact that he sent um, uh, staff down to bring forward more ammunition, the um, horses of the caissons are so weakened they can only draw the limber of the caisson up the side of the ridge. But only one of those limbers actually reaches uh, the battery before Federals reach the crest of the ridge just to the north of here and interdict the route by which those ammunition carrying vehicles would have come. Um, and so additional ammunition does not reach the, uh, the battery. Slocum will turn um, the guns to be able to fire at Federals who have made the crest of the ridge just to, north, to the north of him. Uh, but Federal artillery fire at that moment will inflict quite a blow on um, this, the right half battery of the 5th Company. An artillery projectile will um, explode within the area of the half battery and will actually cause two of the limber chests, those for the 12-pound Napoleon, with just a few rounds in each of them to explode thereby um, essentially putting those guns out of action. As Slocum learns that um, uh, pe Federals are penetrating also to his left, he orders the um, abandonment of the, uh, of the guns, um, the one gun, at, or the abandonment of the two guns whose limbers have been destroyed, and he orders the other four guns of the battery off of the field and they plunge down the back side of the ridge, the best road route for them being interdicted by the, uh, the Federals. He kept some of the cannoneers close by, hoping that the tide would turn for the Confederates and they could recover the two guns they were having to abandon, um, but the Confederate line now is coming unhinged. 
because he is not moving on a, um, a true road, all four of the guns will become mired um, as they go down the back side of the ridge and they will have to be abandoned. And he's saving only the limbers and teams of um, his six guns and caissons, getting them off of the field. But as the Confederate line begins to, um, uh, to come apart, Federal units, as they reach the crest, will turn left and right and fire into the flanks of the Confederates who are still trying to fight. And even though Bates Division has stopped the Federal attack in its front for a time, they too are going to have to pull off of this position and withdraw eastward into the hills of Missionary Ridge, where they'll put up a brief fight um, before having to abandon that position. And as darkness begins to settle on the battlefield, it becomes increasingly clear that the Confederate line along Missionary Ridge, um, a line that is um, uh, manned by nearly the same number of Union, or uh, same number of soldiers as is attacking them, that that line is coming apart, becoming unhinged because of the poor positioning of the Confederate works, poor coordination between the different um, divisions and brigades along the line, and that defensive scheme that had split brigades um, between the rifle pits and the uh, works at the top of the ridge. Park historian Jim Ogden stands front-facing in a mowed grassy area of Bragg Reservation. To his right, a shrub and gray iron tablet with red lettering marking Confederate troop positions. Behind him is a view of the city of Chattanooga and portions of the wooded slope of Missionary Ridge. To his left, the hill on which he stands goes downward toward a paved road. Bragg, as it turned out, had seemingly the best seat in the house for the disaster now befalling his army. His headquarters had been located here at a cluster of, um, of small board and batten um, uh, cottages that had been constructed on, um, on Missionary Ridge, surrounded by a relatively sizable orchard, uh, and just on the south side of the Moore Crutchfield Road where it went over the crest of Missionary Ridge. The view from this point into Chattanooga Valley had allowed him to see much of what had, had occurred over the last couple of days including on the 25th of November, the beginning of the Federal attack. The Confederate unit that wound up defending at this point Gibson's Louisiana Brigade had only returned to this point, having been initially um, north of the Gap. They were moved south, and by the time they moved forward um, into their fighting position, Federal soldiers were already charging up the slope of the ridge. Cobb's Kentucky Battery had been positioned here as well, and they fire in the effort to stop the federal assaults. But just as occurs at other points along the, uh, the Confederate line in the Army of the Cumberland's assault sector, federal soldiers work their way up near the crest of the ridge, gather their strength, then rush the last short distance and break the Confederate line. There are multiple penetrations of the Confederate line at nearly the same time. And Joseph Hooker, who while delayed by getting or getting across the flooded Chattanooga Creek, Joseph Hooker has finally begun an assault that is rolling up the left of the end of the Confederate line from Rossville Gap northward. Braxton Bragg rides in amongst his, um, his broken troops and tries to, uh, to rally them, um, shouting, here's your general, here's your general some of them shouting back one of the terms of derision of the day, here's your mule, here's your mule, as they continue to the rear. Those units that retained some integrity as they withdrew would find positions from which to fight on the hills of um, Missionary Ridge to the east of this western most famous crest, and the Federals would pursue just a short distance. But this attack, which had not begun until 345, will essentially end just shortly after dark, a little after 5 p.m., when pursuit becomes much more difficult. But Federals now control Missionary Ridge, and much of Bragg's army is now in flight off of the battlefield 
and back towards Georgia. For federal soldiers, the recognition that they have concluded their seizure of Chattanooga um, is, uh, is, is acknowledged with cheers that night as darkness settles on the battlefield. Many of the federal units that had participated in the assault that afternoon of the 25th will bivouac on the ground that they have seized, and overnight, plans will be laid for a pursuit the next day. On November the 26th, federal units will begin moving um, towards the withdrawing federals, and Grant also will begin making plans to be able to send a relief force towards Knoxville, 110 miles to the north. The battles for Chattanooga are over, and Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee is in retreat in towards Georgia. Grant is in pursuit at least a short distance, but Chattanooga, the vital gateway to the Deep South, is now firmly in Union hands. The images shown throughout this program are audio described as follows. Image number one, a black and white sketch in Harper's Weekly titled The Capture of Orchard Knob by Hazen's and Village's Brigades Deployed as Skirmishers November 23, 1863 by Theodore Davis. In the foreground are soldiers firing toward a large hill, Orchard Knob, in the distance. Image number two, video panning from right to left showing four bronze cannons mounted on two wheeled carriages with a blue iron tablet with white lettering between two cannons marking Union positions. Image number three, a map of the battlefields of Chattanooga, Battle of Missionary Ridge, September 25, 1863, compiled and drawn by Edward E. Betts, Park Engineer, 1901, with blue lines indicating Union positions and red lines indicating Confederate positions. Image number four, close-up of the Betts map showing Confederate and Union positions on the southern end or left flank of the Confederate line on Missionary Ridge near Rossville Gap. Image number five, a black and white sketch in Harper's Weekly titled The Army of the Cumberland, the Fourth Corps under General Gordon Granger Storming Missionary Ridge by Theodore Davis. The sketch shows Missionary Ridge in the background with puffs of smoke seen from the ridge from Confederate rifle fire as a cluster of Union soldiers move about in the foreground. Some are marching, some are fighting, some are carrying wounded from the field of battle. Image number six, a black and white photo of Union Major General Absalon Baird, seated, turned slightly to the right, with dark hair combed to the right, and a large handlebar mustache, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat, with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number seven, a black and white photo of Union Brigadier General Richard Johnson, seated, forward-facing, with dark hair and dark beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with one star within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number eight, a black and white photo of Union Major General Phil Sheridan, seated with body turned to the left and head turned to the right with dark hair and dark mustache, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars within the shoulder board on the shoulder. Image number nine, an oil on canvas painting by Thur de Thulstrup of the Battle of Chattanooga, depicting the Battle of Missionary Ridge. The image depicted shows General Ulysses S. Grant using field glass to follow the Union assault on Missionary Ridge from Orchard Knob. Grant is joined by Generals Gordon Granger, left, and General H. George H. Thomas. Image number 10, a black and white photo of heavily wooded Missionary Ridge in the background and undergrowth and saplings in the foreground. Image number 11, 
close-up of the Betts map showing the center of the Confederate line on Missionary Ridge and the Confederate rifle pits out in front of the ridge in red as the Union Army of the Cumberland in blue advances toward the Confederate positions. Image number 12, a black and white photo of Confederate Brigadier General Zachariah Days, seated, slightly turned to the left, with dark hair and full dark beard, wearing a Confederate General's coat. Image number 13, a black and white photo of a cleared wooded area. Missionary Ridge is in the background as a man sits upon one of the many tree stumps in the midground. Image number 14, a black and white photo of Union Lieutenant Colonel Edward Phelps, standing next to a column with his right forearm resting on the base, forward facing with dark hair and full dark beard, wearing dark blue Union officer's coat and dark blue trousers. Image number 15, a color photo of the monument to Colonel Edward Phelps on Missionary Ridge. The monument consists of a bronze cannon tube mounted vertically on a circular granite pedestal. Attached to the pedestal is a bronze shield-shaped inscription tablet. Atop the cannon tube is a cast iron cannon ball. Image number 16, a black and white photo of Confederate Brigadier General William B. Bates, seated, turned slightly to the left, with full dark hair and full dark beard, wearing a gray Confederate general's coat. Image number 17, a black and white photo of Confederate Colonel Randall Gibson, seated, turned to the right, with forearm resting on the top of a wood chair, with dark hair and dark beard, wearing a gray Confederate officer's coat. Image number 18, a black and white photo of Confederate Captain Cuthbert H. Slocum, seated, body turned slightly right, and head turned slightly left, with dark hair and full dark goatee, wearing a gray Confederate officer's coat. Image number 19, a black and white drawing titled Horse-Drawn Artillery, by Edwin Forbes. The image depicts horses pulling a cannon as three soldiers ride on the left three horses hitched one behind the other. Image number 20. Video panning from left to right at Bragg Reservation on Missionary Ridge. In view are four bronze cannons each mounted on a two-wheeled carriage positioned on a rise with trees scattered about them, with the leaves turning to yellow and orange. The Illinois Monument is also situated at this location. It is 21 feet by 21 feet at the base and is 80 feet high. The monument consists of a composite column on a pedestal of rock-faced masonry, four bronze figures of soldiers at the base, and a bronze figure of peace holding a wreath atop the column.